Right. So, do you know, if you study, yeah, so if you study people who are at the pinnacle of anything, you recognize that to get there, motivation was maybe 1% of the formula. Maybe. 1%. And I'll prove it to you. If you want to become a world-class bodybuilder, say an IFBB pro, what that takes is you have to train twice a day, six days a week. You have to have eight meals a day. Your calorie intake is regimented. Your meals are pre-planned and pre-cooked. You don't eat according to taste. You eat according to function. So my trainer, for instance, will eat and I'm going, what are you eating? And he's having the most, he'll have chicken that was boiled without salt. And he'll have like half a kilo of it. And what are you doing? He says, I'm taking in protein. He doesn't say I'm eating. He says, I'm taking in protein. For him, it's functional. It's not taste-based. Then, you will probably have to train for a minimum. And this is if you are a genetic phenom. You'd have to train for a minimum of 10 years before you could get on a stage and compete at an average level with an average global bodybuilder. Average. Okay. So why am I, sa why am I telling you this? All, all of us here, at the beginning of a new year, write these things called New Year's resolutions. And then it, you, you know, you, New Year's resolutions, number one, make more money. Yeah? Uh, number two... Uh, change my boyfriend. Number three, get into shape. Yeah? Number three, get into shape is somewhere in the top three. So what do you do? You go to the gym, you get a gym membership. Yeah? You buy, you go to the local uh, Nike store and you buy like all of your gym gear. You are motivated. You are inspired. You are going to the damn gym. You go to YouTube, you subscribe to all of the fitness channels. You go to your Instagram, you follow all of the fitness models. You are motivated. You are going to the damn gym. You're going to get in shape. That's what you're going to do. The people you're following on YouTube have been working out for a minimum of five years to look like that. So you have the incorrect understanding that after a month of working out, you're going to look like them. So what happens in the first month? You're excited. You go to gym every single month. You know, and you take the pains and your body is sore. But, you know, I'm excited. I'm going to gym. Then life happens. Company doesn't make money, you don't make your targets, you fall a bit ill, something happens. And all of a sudden, you stop going to gym for a day. A day becomes two, two becomes a week. Now all of a sudden, you've had a gym membership for three months and you haven't been in that time. What did, what did you miss? You thought motivation was the formula. Winners don't need motivation. Winners need discipline. Discipline's about getting it done because it needs to get done, not because I feel like it. Not because I'm motivated for it. You think Nelson Mandela was motivated to spend 27 years in prison? <laughs> you think Martin Luther King was motivated to march across the states and proclaim freedom? You think, you know, if you look at people that change the world, they're not doing it because they're motivated. They're doing it because they made a commitment to do it and they disciplined to see it through. Discipline is far more important than motivation, which is why you've got to be careful of the decisions you make. Because once you make the decision, you have to see that decision through. Like my mentor says, first we make the decisions, then the decisions make us. So you've got to be very careful the decisions you make. Be very careful the commitments you make. Motivation, I'm telling you now, is completely overrated. It's important. Don't get me wrong. You know, we meet according to motivation. We feel good. Rah, rah. But uh, that'll fade. You need a stronger will and a deeper commitment to see things through. Discipline, above all else, is the key to unlocking your dreams. It is that voice that stops you from hitting the snooze button. It helps you put in 10 more reps of the dumbbells. It allows you to read those last 5 pages before you close your book. It is everything. My question to you is simple. How do you build a mindset which will allow you to be disciplined. Please tell me how you get disciplined in the comment section below.
In the meanwhile, in grade 10, we touched on what it means to be professional and what it means to be number one, ethical, and number two, run an ethical business. Now, generally speaking, there are two approaches. The first one, moral absolutism. It says there is one ethical solution to any problem. Two, moral relativism. There can be more than one moral solution, depending on all the different factors which are involved. One could also talk about principle-based theories or consequence-based theories. Check out the following videos. Consequentialism. Consequentialism is an ethical theory that judges whether or not something is right by what its consequences are. For instance, most people would agree that lying is wrong. But if telling a lie would help save a person's life, consequentialism says it's the right thing to do. Two examples of consequentialism are utilitarianism and hedonism. Utilitarianism judges consequences by a greatest good for the greatest number standard. Hedonism, on the other hand, says something is good if the consequence produces pleasure or avoids pain. Consequentialism is sometimes criticized because it can be difficult or even impossible to know what the result of an action will be ahead of time. Indeed, no one can know the future with certainty. Also, in some situations, consequentialism can lead to decisions that are objectionable, even though the consequences are arguably good. For example, let's suppose economists could prove that the world economy would be stronger and that most people would be happier, healthier, and wealthier if we just enslaved 2% of the population. Although the majority of people would benefit from this idea, most people would never agree to it. However, when judging the idea solely on its results, as classic consequentialism does, then the end justifies the means. Deontology Deontology is an ethical theory that uses rules to distinguish right from wrong. It is often associated with philosopher Immanuel Kant. Kant believed that ethical actions follow universal moral laws, such as don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat. Deontology is simple to apply. It just requires that people follow the rules and do their duty. This approach tends to fit well with our natural intuition about what is or isn't ethical. Unlike consequentialism, which judges actions by their results, deontology doesn't require weighing the costs and benefits of a situation. This avoids subjectivity and uncertainty because you only have to follow set rules. Despite its strengths, rigidly following deontology can produce results that many people find unacceptable. For example, suppose you're a software engineer and learn that a nuclear missile is about to launch that might start a war. You can hack the network and cancel the launch, but it's against your professional code of ethics to break into any software system without permission. And it's a form of lying and cheating. Deontology advises not to violate these rules. However, in letting the missile launch, thousands of people will die. So, following the rules makes deontology easy to apply. But it also means disregarding the possible consequences of our actions when determining what is right and what is wrong. Virtue Ethics Virtue Ethics is a philosophy developed by Aristotle and other ancient Greeks. It is the quest to understand and live a life of moral character. This character-based approach to morality assumes that we acquire virtue through practice. By practicing being honest, brave, just, generous, and so on, a person develops an honorable and moral character. According to Aristotle, by honing virtuous habits, people will likely make the right choice when faced with ethical challenges. To illustrate the difference among three key moral philosophies, 
ethicists Mark White and Robert Arp refer to the film The Dark Knight, where Batman has the opportunity to kill the Joker. Utilitarians, White and Arp suggest, would endorse killing the Joker. By taking this one life, Batman could save multitudes. Deontologists, on the other hand, would reject killing the Joker simply because it's wrong to kill. But a virtue ethicist would highlight the character of the person who kills the Joker. Does Batman want to be the kind of person who takes his enemies' lives? No. In fact, he doesn't. So, virtue ethics helps us understand what it means to be a virtuous human being. And it gives us a guide for living life without giving us specific rules for resolving ethical dilemmas. In the business world, it is normally assumed that the business owner or owners must be the ones who act ethically, or professional for that matter. However, the truth is that this is and has to be everybody's responsibility. What do you think organizations can do to get people to act ethically or morally? If you said or thought that they must have a code of conduct, then perhaps you may be right. But I have a question for you. Your school most likely has a code of conduct. Does the school having this code of conduct mean that the learners always act accordingly? Is there a way that the school can ensure 100% compliance? What are your ideas around this? Ethics or morality does not end in school. In the workplace, you have to do the right thing as well. The South African government has implemented a framework to assist in service delivery. It is called the Batu Bili Framework. It aims to ensure professional and ethical service delivery. So, I live in the very beautiful city of Ekorulen, and the public servants here try by all means to live out the principles of Batu Bili. This is not the only code to work by, mind you. There is also the King Code of Ethics, and the way that the companies act is set out. It enshrines morality and ethical behavior in all registered businesses. Business is far from being black and white. There are many gray areas, but a fantastic tool which I found in the Focus textbook to make things a little bit more clearer is the three-point test. So what is the three-point test? Well, you simply ask yourself three questions. Number one, will it break any of the country's laws or any company policy? Two, how will it make me feel? And how would the people who care about me see me? And number three, will the stakeholders benefit? If not, who stands to lose the most? If there is even one single no, then do not go ahead with the decision. It's as simple as that. Okay, so I have spoken a lot about ethics and how to decide whether a particular course of action is ethical or not. From what you have seen or experienced or what you know about businesses out there, what behavior has any business or business people for that matter done which could be interpreted as unethical? Is this the norm? Do you think that there could be a way that this could change? Tell me in the comment section below. So, what is so important about this chapter? Why must you learn about professionalism and ethics? Well, any public relations practitioner worth their salt will tell you that the benefits of a great corporate governance is worth its weight in gold. Oprah, Henry Ford, even Einstein attests to this. 
Woolworths has an awesome campaign where they source their honey from farms that do not endanger the lives of honey badgers. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got Nestle, which reckons that if they were to implement an Australian slavery reporting law, customers could potentially bear the burden of higher prices for their chocolates. This after a Supreme Court in America heard cases about how child slavery is rampant on cocoa farms in Africa. How does this make you feel? Are you worried about the kids or do you simply not care? Well, thank you for joining me and I hope that you picked up a lot that will help you with your studies in professionalism and ethics. Please join me next time for the next lesson. In the meanwhile, you can check out all the previous videos. Thank you till the next time. Bye.